He is among the most valiant warriors of Gondor and the son of the steward. His deeds in war and his heroic journeys would define a life that would end much too soon. Today on Nerd of the Rings, we cover the life and travels of Boromir. Boromir is born in 2978 of the Third Age to his father Denethor II and his mother Fenduilas, sister of Prince Imrahil of Dol Amroth. Five years later, in 2983, Fenduilas gives birth to his younger brother, Faramir. The following year, Boromir's grandfather, Ecthelion II, dies at the age of 98, and Denethor takes over his father's role, becoming the 26th ruling steward of Gondor. Tragically, Fenduilas would die just four years later at the age of 38, after falling under the shadow of Mordor. She leaves behind a 10-year-old Boromir, a 5-year-old Faramir, and a grieving husband. After his wife's death, Denethor becomes more grim and silent than ever before. The brothers turn to each other and form a great bond as they grow up together. Over the years, Boromir grows to become a great warrior. While his brother would learn wisdom from Gandalf the Grey and develop a love of lore and music, Boromir would be far more interested in warfare and tales of old battles. Despite the fact that Denethor would grow to heavily favor Boromir, there was never any rivalry between the brothers. We are told Boromir would always act as Faramir's helper and protector. On the night of June 19th, 3018, Faramir and Boromir share a similar dream. This prophetic dream came to Faramir twice previously, though he said nothing of it at the time. Boromir would recount the dream during the later Council of Elrond. In that dream, I thought the eastern sky grew dark and there was a growing thunder, but in the west a pale light lingered, and out of it I heard a voice, remote but clear, crying, Seek for the sword that was broken, in Imladris it dwells. There shall be counsels taken, stronger than Morgul spells. There shall be shown a token, that doom is near at hand, for Isildur's bane shall waken, and the halfling forth shall stand. The following day, Sauron launches a sudden attack on Osgiliath, where Boromir and Faramir are both stationed. The forces of Gondor are outnumbered by the forces of Mordor, whose numbers are swelled by the Easterlings and the Haradrim. Boromir would later describe the presence of a power that he had not felt before, issuing from a great black horseman. Unknown to Boromir, this horseman was one of the Nazgul, and the entire attack was made to test Gondor's strength and to provide cover for the Nazgul to search the north for the One Ring. Only a remnant of Gondor's eastern force survives the assault. Boromir and Faramir fight valiantly alongside a company of Gondorians, defending the last bridge across the Anduin. Finally, the bridge is destroyed, and the brothers and just two other soldiers survive by swimming across the mighty river. With the eastern portion of Osgiliath under his control and the bridge now destroyed, Sauron calls off the assault. His purpose of allowing the Nazgul to pass in secret is achieved. Despite his victory, Sauron realizes that Gondor's forces are indeed stronger than he expected, and he would spend the next several months amassing a force with which to make war upon Minas Tirith. Boromir and Faramir would speak with their father of their shared dream. Denethor, who is said to have been wise in the lore of the kingdom, tells his son that the Imladris of the Rhyme is Rivendell, where the half-elven Lord Elrond lives, and that it is a dale located in the far north. Faramir is eager to seek for Imladris himself. However, since the way is full of doubt and danger, being that they didn't even know Rivendell's location, Boromir takes the journey upon himself. On July 4, 3018, Boromir departs Minas Tirith, making his way north through the lands of Rohan. He passes through the Gap of Rohan, traveling north through the lands that lie west of the Misty Mountains. Near Tharbad, Boromir crosses the Grey Flood, using a dangerous ford and in the process, loses his horse. 
Thus, he is left to make the rest of his journey on foot. In Unfinished Tales, Tolkien gives us a note on how great an accomplishment this journey was. When Boromir made his great journey from Gondor to Rivendell, the courage and hardihood required is not fully recognized in the narrative. The North-South Road no longer existed, except for the crumbling remains of the causeways, by which a hazardous approach to Tharbad might be achieved, only to find ruins on dwindling mounds, and a dangerous ford formed by the ruins of the bridge, impassable if the river had not been there slow and shallow but wide. After 110 days on the road, Boromir arrives in Rivendell on October 24th, the very day Frodo awakens in Imladris. With his fortuitous timing, Boromir attends the Council of Elrond on October 25th. There he speaks of Gondor's efforts to keep the armies of Sauron from crossing the Anduin. The purpose of his journey, however, is not aid, but counsel. He tells them of the dream and receives some answers. Aragorn reveals the shards of Narsil, the blade that was broken, and the halfling, Frodo Baggins, produces the One Ring, Isildur's bane. Boromir then attempts to persuade the council to let him take the One Ring to Gondor, so that it may be used in defense of the realm. Elrond, however, explains that this is not an option, that only Sauron alone could use the ring, and any attempt of doing good with the One Ring would be twisted to evil. Boromir joins the Fellowship of the Ring to aid Frodo Baggins in his journey to destroy the One Ring. He joins not to go the entire way, but with the intention to travel with the others until breaking off for Minas Tirith. Throughout their journey, Boromir at times proves to be both wise and mighty. When they make for the Pass of Karatras, he says each of the Fellowship should take with them a small bundle of wood. When the Fellowship is caught on the mountain pass, Having this wood prevents the company from freezing to death. Aragorn and Boromir would then plow their way back down the mountain, carrying the hobbits and leading the others to safety. With the Redhorn Pass no longer an option, Boromir suggests the company travel south along the Misty Mountains and either pass through the Gap of Rohan or go through the southern lands of Gondor. Gandalf replies that because of Saruman's treachery, it was not safe to go that direction and that they should instead go through the mines of Moria. Boromir says he will only go that route should the entire rest of the company vote against him. The Fellowship, of course, does indeed travel to Moria, and on January 13, 3019, as they arrive at the doors, Boromir is frustrated by Gandalf not knowing the password and throws a stone into the nearby water. The Watcher in the water would be roused and attack the group before they escape into the mines. The Fellowship travels for two days, coming to the Chamber of Mazarbul, where they are attacked by orcs. Boromir fights valiantly, blocking the western door and hewing at the arm of the cave troll. When the Fellowship later reaches the Bridge of Khazad-dûm, they are attacked again by orcs, and the mysterious presence from Mazarbul is revealed to be a Balrog. Boromir sounds his great horn, causing the orcs to temporarily pause before leading a second charge. When Gandalf fights the Balrog, the mighty warriors Boromir and Aragorn run toward him. But as they reach the bridge, it breaks, and both Gandalf and his foe are lost to the depths far below. As Aragorn now leads the company after the loss of Gandalf, he leads them to Lothlorien. Boromir is wary, saying the woods are perilous and few escape unscathed. Aragorn, however, corrects him, saying only those who are evil or bring evil with them have reason to fear Lorien. When they leave Lorien on February 16th, Boromir's gift from Galadriel is a golden belt. As the Fellowship continues their journey, it becomes apparent that Boromir is being affected by the One Ring. He begins muttering to himself and occasionally paddles his boat shared by Merry and Pippin closer to Frodo's. Pippin even notices an odd glint in Boromir's eye as he looks at the ring bearer. When the company reaches the lake of Nen Hithuel, near Amon Hen, they must decide which route to take. Frodo goes off into the woods to consider the options, and after a while, Boromir follows. 
Their discussion of what Frodo should do would make Boromir's falling under the influence of the ring all the more apparent. Will you not at the council? answered Frodo. Because we cannot use it, and what is done with it turns to evil. Boromir got up and walked about impatiently. So you go on, he cried. Gandalf Elrond, all these folks have taught you to say so. For themselves they may be right. These elves and half-elves and wizards, they would come to grief, perhaps. Yet often I doubt if they are wise and not merely timid. True-hearted men, they will not be corrupted. We of Minas Tirith have been staunch through long years of trial. We do not desire the power of wizard lords, only strength to defend ourselves. And behold, in our need chance brings to light the ring of power. It is a gift, I say, a gift to the foes of Mordor. It is mad not to use it, to use the power of the enemy against him. The fearless, the ruthless, these alone will achieve victory. What could not a warrior do in this hour, a great leader? What could not Aragorn do? Or if he refuses, why not Boromir? The ring would give me power of command. How I would drive the hosts of Mordor, and all men would flock to my banner. Boromir strode up and down, speaking ever more loudly. Almost he seemed to have forgotten Frodo, while his talk dwelt on walls and weapons, and the mustering of men, and he drew plans for great alliances and glorious victories to be. And he cast down Mordor, and became himself a mighty king, benevolent and wise. Suddenly he stopped and waved his arms. Boromir attempts to convince Frodo to come to Minas Tirith at least for a little while, even if just to rest and hear news of the enemy before moving on. When Boromir lays his hand on the halfling, Frodo quickly steps away, alarmed by Boromir's behavior. Why are you so unfriendly? said Boromir. I am a true man, neither thief nor tracker. I need your ring, that you know now. But I give you my word that I do not desire to keep it. Will you not at least let me make trial of my plan? Lend me the ring. No, no, cried Frodo. The council laid it upon me to bear it. It is by our own folly that the enemy will defeat us, cried Boromir. Obstinate fool, running willfully to death and ruining our cause. If any mortals have claim to the ring, it is the men of Numenor and not halflings. It is not yours save by unhappy chance. It might have been mine. It should be mine. Give it to me! When Frodo leaves by using the ring, Boromir trips on a stone, and falling on the ground, coming to his senses, he weeps for what he has done, and calls for Frodo to return. When Boromir returns to the rest of the company, he reveals only that he had argued with Frodo, and Merry and Pippin run off to search for their friend. Aragorn instructs Boromir to follow the two hobbits and guard them. When Boromir catches up to Merry and Pippin, they are surrounded by dozens of orcs. He charges into battle, killing many of the orcs and causing the rest to flee. As he leads the hobbits back toward the campsite, they are waylaid by at least a hundred orcs. Boromir sounds the great horn and fights valiantly against the foul orcs. He is pierced by arrow after arrow and still he fights on. Many arrows are shot before the son of Denethor falls, and the hobbits are taken prisoner. Aragorn discovers Boromir surrounded by at least 20 dead orcs. He confesses to trying to take the ring from Frodo. Aragorn reassures him, saying he was forgiven and that he had redeemed himself. Aragorn says that Minas Tirith shall not fall, and with a smile, Boromir dies on February 26th 3019, at the age of 41. The three hunters put Boromir's body in one of the elven boats, along with his cloven horn and broken sword. The weapons of his enemies are laid at his feet, and his funeral boat is carried by the Anduin over the falls of Rauros, as Aragorn and Legolas sing a lament in his memory. Three nights later, Faramir either saw or beheld a vision of a boat floating past him on the river in Osgiliath. He would later recount to Frodo and Sam, hearing the great horn sounding in the distance the very day his brother died. It is said that the boat bearing Boromir would continue down the Anduin, and that his final resting place would be out into the great sea. 
Boromir's horn would later wash ashore and be taken to Denethor. With the news of his death reaching Minas Tirith, Denethor and Faramir are stricken with grief and left to carry on in defense of Gondor without their beloved Boromir. As always, I want to say a huge thank you to my Patreon supporters who make this channel possible. Tom DeBombadil19, Listen Me the Cinda, Kella Brimbor, The Mighty Mim, Team Weasel, Rabbi Rob Thomas, Charles Leisure, Toby Mobs Music, CCDC Red Team, Nerd Sigman Anytimer, Pelkey Sports Cards, Mookie the Brown, Christopher Carbaugh, Joe Tepper, Sky Carcass, Slide Belts, Dane Ragnarsson, Salim Rahman, Zetrock, Bertelberg, Grand Strategy Nerd, Graham Derricott, The Dark Haired One, Wyland, Michael Wu, and Debbie. If you enjoyed the artwork in this video, check out the artists in the description and purchase prints of their great work for yourself. Thanks so much for watching and subscribing, and we'll see you next time on Nerd of the Rings.